And they both ran together. And that other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And when he stooped down, he saw the linen cloths lying, but yet he went not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and saw the linen cloths lying. Words taken from the gospel today. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Notice that John outran Peter. He's the younger of the disciples, of the apostles. But this is highly significant to the fathers. It represents that he respected authority. That he understood that Peter was the first of the apostles. So he waited until he came before he entered in to the tomb to see where our Lord had been laid and was gone. This is important because if you look at Peter, he had fallen, denied our Lord three times. And John was aware of this because he and John were the ones that went to the trial in uh, Annas' and then Caiaphas' house. It's held to be that it is St. John that got Peter in the door. John was known to the high priest, probably, some say, because of his family business, of the fishing business. But in any case, he knew about Peter's failures. And he didn't say, Peter, who do you think you are? You failed. I'm outrunning you. I'm going to go and do my own thing. No, he waited for the Pope, even though the Pope was in big trouble, having denied our Lord three times. So let us always uh, take this example that's from the very beginning and respect those in authority, even when they've made big mistakes. We still recognize they're endowed with the dignity of the office that is bestowed upon them by God through his church, but in Peter's case, by God directly. Second of all, we can see today in this whole week the importance of the resurrection we are going to get our bodies back our very same body but glorified so our resurrected body will be the same body we now possess as our own this is because it is part of who we are thus listen to the roman catechism it says it is of vital importance to be fully convinced that the identical body which belongs to each of us during life shall, though corrupt and dissolved into its original dust, be raised again to life. It is a truth conveyed by the apostle when he says, this corruptible body must put on incorruption. Evidently, the catechism says, designating by the word this, his own body. It is also clearly expressed in the prophecy of Job. In my flesh, I shall see my God, says Job, whom I myself shall see and mine eyes behold and not another. Further, this same truth is inferred from the very definition of resurrection. For resurrection, as St. John Damascene defines it, is a return to the state from which one has fallen. Finally, if we bear in mind the arguments by which we have just established a future resurrection, every doubt on the subject must at once disappear. We have said that the body is to rise again, that everyone may receive the proper things of the body according as he hath done, whether it be good or evil in the body. Man is therefore to rise again in the same body, with which he served God, or was a slave to the devil, that in the same body he may experience rewards and a crown of victory, or endure the severest punishments and torments. The Roman Catechism. Thank you. We can also see just in light of the people in the resurrection Mary Magdalene, big sinner, and she's the first that our Lord appears to after Our Lady. Peter, big sinner, and yet he's the one who enters the tomb first of the apostles. It's a sign that 
even though we may have been big sinners, if we cooperate with God, He will raise us up and will overcome all evil if we cooperate with God. Peter and Magdalene show this. God is into making penitence great and overcome the past. Furthermore, this is very important for our time when many are once again falling into the error of reincarnation. It's all over the place. And reincarnation is that the soul can get another body. That the body is just inhabited. It does not make us individual human beings. Thus, if you join Scientology, you sign a billion-year contract with them because you're going to be reincarnated continuously. Thus, sign the contract now and you can continue to work for us in a billion years How silly, how stupid. But in fact, people have even heard pro-death supporters, those that are for abortion, say that the souls of fetuses, little babies, were better off being aborted since they would be reincarnated in better circumstances. Isn't that convenient? No, once a soul is incarnated into a body, that particular body is part of who they are. The resurrection of Christ teaches us this lesson. It says, look at my hands and look at my feet, that it is I myself. This is also important today to counter the craze of our modern culture to cremate our loved ones upon death. Reducing their bodies to ashes is not a very good sign of the resurrection and the love and honor we owe them. Now, let us turn uh, from our Lord to Our Lady on this Saturday. For our edification, let us consider the description of the glorified body of Our Lady given to the priest sculptor, Father McGlynn, Dominican, who was carving the statue for the shrine of Our Lady of Fatima in Portugal. It is the one that is over the main door, the one that recounts the vision of June 13. In describing Our Lady, uh, Sister Lucia mentions various details. She says the beautiful lady did not show her hair. The lady wore two visible garments, a simple tunic and a long veil or mantle. The tunic had no collar or cuffs and was drawn in around the waist, although there was no visible sash. Both tunic and mantle, now she describes them as, and here's the important part, waves of light, one on top of the other. Both were white in color and were, as it were, pure light. Now, I mention this because someone recently said, when I said that the only man-made things in heaven, as far as I know, are the wounds of Christ. We made those, and he glorified them. Someone said, but Our Lady didn't go to heaven without any clothes on, so she had her clothes on, so she took her man-made clothes into heaven with her. No. She had a glorified body when she rose up, and the clothes were, as it were, formed around her. You'll see what I mean in a moment. There was a line of gold on the mantle like a thin thread, a ray of sunlight all around the mantle, she said. Father McGlynn asked, was Our Lady's flesh the color of flesh or of light? Flesh-colored light, Lucia replied. Light which took on the color of flesh. She was all of light. The light had various tones, yellow and white and various other colors. It was more intense and less intense. It was by the different tones and by the differences of intensity that one saw what was hand and what was mantle and what was face and what was tunic. Sister Lucia, thank you. Now recall two of the qualities of a glorified body. First, their subtility, which enables the complete domination of the soul over the body, making it independent of all things material. So this is a quality of the glorified body. 
The soul dominates the body. The glorified soul, the glorified person. The soul will dominate the body, making it independent of all things material. Thus, it seems that Our Lady does not have a wardrobe, but rather her soul forms the clothes as she wills them. So there's not like this wardrobe in heaven. She's going to come today as Our Lady of Lords. She's going to come today as Our Miraculous Medals. She's going to come today as Our Lady of Sorrows. No, there's no wardrobe in heaven. She wills it. In October 13, apparition 1917, she appeared as Our Lady of the Rosary. At, that is of Fatima. She appeared as Our Lady of Sorrows. And finally, as Our Lady of Mount Carmel. I think that's fantastic. This all happened not because she went to a wardrobe and changed clothing, but she mentally has the power in her soul to change her clothing. Now, next, we can also think of clarity. It's a quality of the glorified body, which is a splendor and translucency of the body originating in the soul, which may be hidden at the will of the soul. Thus, she can show herself or not at will. Thus, our Lord can show himself or not. This is part of the glorified body. It's the teaching of the church and the saints, the doctors. Just a side note, just as our Lord in his resurrected body came to bring peace to the apostles. Remember, peace be to you. He said, and he breathed on them. So also our lady comes to bring a period of peace for the world if her plan at Fatima is fulfilled. But let's consider, Our Lady came at Rudabach in 1830 to St. Catherine Labre, the miraculous medal, Our Lady of Grace with all the rays flowing through her rings. She allowed St. Catherine to weep in her lap in the convent. And on December 10th, 1925, Sister Lucia, Our Lady visited her in the convent. Our Lady placed her hand on Lucia's shoulder and requested the first Saturdays. It seems then Our Lady was present body and soul in Fatima, not just in an imaginative vision of some kind. She did process through the air and up into the heavens when she came and when she returned. She came from the east and processed back to the east and then up. When Our Lady was finished with the children of Fatima, Lucia explains, she began to rise serenely going up towards the east until she disappeared in the immensity of space. The light that surrounded her seemed to open up a path before her in the firmament. And for this reason, we sometimes said we saw heaven opening. Oh, what wondrous things God has planned for those who love him, for those who hate sin and refuse to give it a place in their mortal bodies so that God will grant them glorified bodies along with our Lord and our Lady. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.